Okay, so today we're going to talk a little bit about um, front-end conundrums, um, how to decide how to implement something uh, in the front end with Drupal. And uh, I don't know if I'm the only one who uh, comes across these conundrums, but there's often many ways to do things in Drupal. And often as a front-end developer, uh, it's a question of whether to do something with theming or whether to do something with configuration site building. So I'm going to go through some examples in this, in this session. And uh, if you have thoughts or if you have uh, additional conundrums that you face that you want to talk about, uh, there'll be lots of time, I think, at the end. So uh, we'll have lots of time for questions and we can discuss other examples. Sorry? Is your mic on? Uh, I don't have a mic. Oh, okay. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me if I talk more like this? Is this better? Yeah? It's okay? Okay. Sorry? Don't they want to record the session? Oh, it's being recorded here. Oh. This red thing. Everything we're saying is being recorded. <laughs> but it's okay. You can hear me in the back. Is it okay? You can also come closer. There's like a window. <laughs> okay. Great. Uh, so just as an introduction for those of you who I haven't met yet, um, my name is Suzanne Degachova. I work at Evolving Web. We're a Drupal development shop based in Montreal. And I do a lot of Drupal trainings, but I also do work on Drupal projects. So I do some, some theming, some site building, and sometimes some module development. Uh, and my Twitter handle is Suzanne underscore Kennedy if you want to follow me and keep track of what I'm up to. So I, at Evolving Web, we do projects for all kinds of clients, uh, some government, some universities, uh, some nonprofit, for profit, uh, so uh, quite a variety. Uh, and just as a quick pitch to you, uh, if you are interested in Drupal training, uh, or if you know anyone who is, we have some training coming up in Ottawa in uh, September. Uh, and so if you're all interested in learning more about Drupal 8 theme, module development, site building, come talk to me or uh, you can find more on our website. Okay, so to get to the, the content of the session, so uh, we're going to be talking about uh, approaches to Drupal front end. And so just to start off, to get us all on the same page, uh, I want to talk about what that means, like what, our, what approaches are available. Um, oh, someone really doesn't like front end. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, whenever you're facing, um, well, approaches to front end, front end techniques, when this comes into play is usually that moment when you get the design for the project, or maybe you're just starting off with the wireframes, or maybe you just have some uh, very rough mock-ups that you're using to implement the site, or, or maybe the, the client or the designer just says, oh, just make it look like this other website. Uh, so it's that moment when you get that design, whatever it is, and you have to uh, take that and start doing the site building, start doing the uh, so how many of you here are strictly cleaners? Uh, okay, I'll make a couple of people. And how many of you are site builders? What do the rest of you do? <laughs> <laughs> so maybe some of you are wear all the hats. You're like site builder, themer, you do the module development, you keep the lights on. Yeah, so um, in, in either case, um, sometimes themers tend to, to like more doing things in, in themes, actually, like writing templates and things, and sometimes site builders are looking more for the site building approach to something. Um, but a lot of times when you're implementing the, the front end of the site, uh, there's this breakdown between things that you're doing in a theme, things that you're writing in code, and then things that you're doing through configuration. So building views, making content types, uh, image styles, site blocks, all of those things. Um, but it tends to be the same person who does both, both of these things in conjunction. So anyone who calls himself a cleaner typically also does a lot of configuration uh, because in Drupal, even if you like to keep these things separate, there's a lot of interplay between 
between the two. So the mean techniques tend to be more on the side of writing templates, maybe adding pre process functions, um, setting up background image, images, actually creating regions, and of course writing CSS and JavaScript. Uh, so usually you're doing both of them at the same time. So the question is more, not about like, are you doing configuration or theming? You're probably doing both. The question is like, are you trying to do, put things more into the, the theme side or are you trying to do things strictly with configuration when you can? So I'm gonna walk through specific examples, but, but this tends to be kind of the, the, the question that I want. Uh, so part of planning your front-end approach, part of deciding what to do with, in the theme and what to do through configuration, um, it depends on your situation. So are you going to be maintaining this site yourself, or is it a whole team of people who's going to be maintaining it? Or are you building it and then passing it off to a client? So who's doing the maintenance uh, really makes a big difference. Maybe you feel very comfortable in the theme writing like templates and so adding CSS, but maybe the person maintaining the site is going to have a hard time with that. Uh, the configuration management workflow. So who, who here is familiar with configuration management? People. So, so the idea is that in Drupal 8, when you're going through and configuring your site, you're adding your views, you're adding your content types, you're setting up fields. Uh, every time you do that, those changes go into the database, right? So Drupal is a content management system, so the content goes into the database, but also all of these configuration changes. Um, but when you're actually, you've launched your site and uh, the, the site is up and running, um, it's possible to export all that configuration and so put it into the code and then uh, let's say move that from your development site to your production site. So in Drupal 8, that, this configuration piece is really uh, easy to separate out from your content. Uh, and that means that you can set up a workflow so that when you're running your site you can have uh, configuration that you take from development, put into production uh, really easily. So if you have a good workflow for that setup, it's going to be easy for you to move configuration around. Um, but if it turns out that there's a lot of people editing configuration on the live site, um, it then it might be harder for you to manage. So it's important when you're actually planning your front-end approach to know um, where the configuration is going to be happening once the site is launched and if you're going to be using a configuration management workflow. Uh, another thing to consider is whether you expect the visual design to change and evolve. This is a hard question to answer usually. You get the design and you say, oh yeah, the design is uh, it's final, right? Final design, like the PDF here says final. <laughs> um, but sometimes final isn't really final, so um, if you expect things to change, this might mean that you want to make the, the site more flexible. So you might be looking for a more uh, configurable approach rather than hard coding things into, into code. Um, and then another question to ask is if you need to make something a setting. So if you're going to be using the same kind of look and feel for multiple sites and you need to make something into a setting, that means that uh, it's got to be really easy to, to switch on and off a certain element. So for example, if you have uh, some branding colors that you're using throughout your theme, and that needs to be a setting that can change from site to site. That's an important thing to know when you're implementing a front end design. So that's just another thing to, to keep in mind. So these are questions we're going to be asking ourselves as we go through and, and actually uh, look at the different scenarios that we face. So, so types of conundrums, so the, the types of things that, uh, I'm going to be talking about, uh, and what I'm talking about, these are just some examples, but there's lots more examples that fall into all these categories. So um, when you're implementing, let's say, the layout of content, so like the, the content for a certain content type, uh, how, how does the site know where the fields actually go on that page? Uh, field HTML, so if you know, like, or if your SEO friend tells you you have to make a certain element in H2, how do you do that? 
Do you do it with a template? Do you do it in a uh, Images. So often designs are full of visual images and we have to figure out if they should be background images or inline images or if they should be uh, uh, added through a view or through a field. So just how do we get those images to show up on the page? Block placement. So where blocks are, how blocks know where to appear on the page. Uh, adding JavaScript to our site. And then also uh, setting up web forms. So if you have a lot of forms on your site, you might be doing a lot of form styling. Where does all that, where does all that go? Okay, so I'm gonna be showing a bunch of screenshots with little snippets of uh, design. And then we're gonna talk about how we could implement this. So <laughs> it's kind of uh, taken a bit out of context, but this is the header of a page. So imagine that there's a whole full page here, and this is just, just the header. Uh, and a lot of the pages on this site have uh, a main kind of, well, obviously a page title, but they also have a video that needs to go up into the header. So the question is, how do we build this up? So we've got our page title, we've got our video, and then we've got some kind of uh, breadcrumbs here as well. Another example of something really similar, so I'm sure you've, you've all seen designs that have big kind of content headers like this. So this is another kind of banner at the top of a, a page for, this is a page for school board content type, and uh, here we've got an address there and a link to a website and a big background image. So again, we've got a whole bunch of uh, content about this, this uh, page that's up along with the page title. So if we really wanted to do this the, the theme way, one approach would be to create a template uh, for the page title and add some content to it. So that second example that had the, the uh, school address and the link to the website and the background image, um, those are all things that are being added kind of around the page title. And in Drupal 8, the page title is already uh, a block. It's something that we can see. It's got a template file just for the page title itself, as well as for the whole page title block. So it would be possible to go in and modify that template and add some extra components like that background image and like the extra fields. Uh, a more configuration way to do it would be to create a view to display these things. So let's say we have we have the page title as a block already, um, but maybe we don't want to use that block. We can we can leave that block uh, disabled for this particular page, and instead we can create a view to display all these elements. So if you're if you're going with the views approach, you would go ahead and uh, create a view with a contextual filter that says, okay, take the title of this page, take the address for the, the content, the link and the background image, and uh, print those all out as fields, and then they can be styled like this and displayed as a block on the page. Um, so the views approach is probably a lot simpler, um, but it means swapping out that page title block with this view version on, on these pages, uh, and it just means that you have a different way of treating page titles on uh, school board pages than all the other pages of the site. Uh, so typically, like, which approach do you choose? Um, uh, again, it kind of depends on the site. Uh, there's also some planning ahead that you'd want to do. You'd want to look at other pages on the site and see if they fall into the same kind of pattern. If other pages also have extra data that are added in the, in the page title. Um, but typically I would find that the views approach would be a lot simpler because if you were to create a template file out of this, the template file would be quite complicated and maybe hard for other people to, uh, to manage. Um, the advantage of doing it with a template file is that then any time you, um, you uh, go and apply the same theme to other sites, you kind of get the same functionality. 
Um, but in this case, because the template file would have so much content logic in it, uh, it, might not, it might not be worth that trade-off. So in this case, I'd say that the views approach, the configuration approach would win out uh, in most cases. Uh, so my next example is looking at a node layout. So this is a, an example from a site that has a lot of articles on it. And each article has the image of the article at the top. And then on the left, there's some fields. And on the right, there's some fields. And, uh, and so there's kind of a layout for each of these article nodes. Another example here is for a product content type. This isn't a product that you can buy, it's just a, a product that the company is listing. And there's a guy that ends at the top, you've got a title and category, you've got some overview information, and then some supporting data on the right. So again, it's sort of like a layout within the node. So each node of this type is going to follow this same layout. So for uh, creating a layout for a node, and then here I'm talking about creating a layout for all the nodes of a particular content type. Uh, so it's not necessarily uh, something like uh, as flexible as uh, a panelizer approach where you have a different layout for every single piece of content. Uh, with this requirement, you could take a really a theming approach and create a node template for the content type. So for the product or for the article, you could say, okay, here's a, a node template that places the fields where they need to be. So within that template file, you could create the, the markup to create your two column layout with maybe a header. And then in there, you can print out the, the different fields. Uh, and in Drupal 8, if you're using Drupal 8, the, the way to do this would be to take the content render array, which is what is actually going to contain all the fields for the node, and maybe split that up into a couple parts. So maybe you're going to print out most of the fields in one spot, and then you take the rest of the fields and print them out where they need to go on the page. Uh, so that would be the theming approach, creating the node template. Uh, another approach would be to um, define a layout in your theme. So there's a new a new exciting thing in Drupal 8, um, the, the Layouts Initiative. And this uh, allows any theme or module to define layouts. And you might have done this already if you're a, a Drupal 8 uh, front-end developer and you had maybe made some layouts for panels or you were working with display seats and you made a custom layout. Uh, so in Drupal 8, there's sort of this one new system uh, for creating layouts that you can define. Um, and then you can use the the modules, these are two core experimental modules, layout discovery and field layout. And these allow you to place fields into a layout. So in that manage display tab that you normally use to pick formatters for your fields, you can actually put your fields into like a two column, two column layout or a three column layout or whatever kind of custom layout you create. So that would be definitely a more configuration style approach because you're setting up configuration on the site so that someone who's just a site builder can use those fields around. So it's probably going to be an approach that's a bit more um, uh, easy for someone to change if they're not looking at. Uh, so if you expect you know, additional fields to be added in the future, that would be uh, a much more sustainable approach than having somebody like that go in and update the template file. So if we look again at the the screenshot here. Like right now, these are going to be link fields. And right now, there's just uh, four of them. But in the future, maybe there'll be another, another field over there in the second column. So making this a, uh, using configuration to manage the layout would be a more sustainable approach. Uh, that being said, uh, the configuration approach, the approach on the right here, uh, this involves adding two modules. And as I mentioned, they're still experimental, so uh, take this approach with a grain of salt. You would want to wait for these modules to be uh, full core modules. Um, 
in order to use them on a production site. Um, but, but that being said, uh, it does still require enabling two, two additional modules um, and then actually coming up with the code for the layout. So it's not just this completely configuration approach. There's still some work involved in your theme because you'd be defining that layout in your theme. Uh, typically, you want to define layouts in your theme instead of using the, the default Drupal layouts because that's going to allow you to control the responsiveness of the, of the layout and uh, make sure it's following the patterns of all the other layouts on your site. Uh, content grids. So often on your site, uh, often within the content of, of a page, you'll have some kind of grid as content. Uh, so for example, uh, this is from a home page content type or a landing page content type. And here we have three data points and they're uh, placed into, into a three column grid. So you've probably all seen designs that include this, especially landing pages tend to have these kind of uh, content that's displayed in three columns. Sometimes they're calls to action, sometimes they're just text, sometimes they're images, uh, sometimes they're like uh, selling points for a product. Uh, they tend to be on marketing type pages, but basically it's content that you're trying to put into a grid. So the question is, if you have these set up as fields, um, how would you go about putting them into this kind of layout, into this kind of grid? So in either case, one nice technique to start with would be using the paragraphs module. Um, if you haven't heard of the paragraphs module, it's a way of setting up compound fields. So just representing this content, like having a three fields with a label the city number, and then some supporting text. That's something that Paragraphs manages really well, because you can have a field that has three subfields on it. Uh, and so that's how I would recommend kind of starting off in either case. If you want to go and do a more configuration approach, you can create a view to, to actually place the three columns on the page. And uh, a view is kind of uh, a nice way to do this, an easy way to do this, because in Drupal 8, views come with a, a grid format. So you can actually tell Drupal, oh yeah, make a view of this data, and then just put that view into, put the content of that view into a three column grid. Um, and uh, you can tell views what classes to use. So just taking a completely configuration approach, you can come up with this this three column grid. Uh, of course, you'd still have to write some CSS to get the, the different sizes and the typography and everything, but you could do the, the layout part just with configuration. Uh, a more theme style approach would involve placing the content in a grid using a template. So in, in Drupal 8, uh, you have a, a you have templates available for all kinds of fields that you're adding, including paragraphs. And so for this kind of uh, content, you would have a, a template file that you could use for the paragraphs field, for the, you know, all the data points field. And then you would also have a template file that you could use for each individual item. And so if you uh, wanted to put these into a grid, you could add classes at either level to, to, to do the grid. Uh, and if you're using a CSS framework like Bootstrap, you're going to have classes already available that you can just apply to the template file. Or if you're writing the CSS from scratch, you would add the classes and then write the CSS to, uh, to float the items or to use a, a flexbox uh, approach. Uh, so in this case, I really like the theming option a lot better um, because having a whole extra view just to display a field that's attached to the node that you're looking at seems a little bit overkill to me. Um, 
but that being said, if you set this up as a view, it would be easier for someone to come along and add maybe another field to the data points and then to integrate that easily into the view without touching the theme. Um, so for sure the configuration option is a bit more flexible. Um, the other advantage of the configuration option is that as soon as something's a view, it means that you can display it as a block on the page. So if you've got this landing page where you have these data points and you might eventually need to move it up the page or down the page, um, just having it available as a block means that you have that flexibility. Whereas if something's a field, it can only be displayed within the node itself. So you can't intermingle it with other blocks. So it's just a, a slightly different way of displaying the data that might suit your site's needs better. So for example, if you have this on a landing page and you have another block on the landing page that you placed and you wanted to move it below that block, that would be really easy to do with the configuration approach and a bit harder to do with the, the theme approach. Okay, also on the topic of outputting your, your content, outputting your notes, uh, often you want to change the HTML output of specific fields. So this is an example from uh, a book content type, which has a lot of fields. I've kind of just truncated this. This is just the first part of the, the book page. Um, and this just shows a few of the fields that are attached to the book. So this is a, a website for a publishing company. So each book has a lot of data associated with it, like number of pages, the ISBN number, uh, the link to buy the book, which is at this point an external link. Um, and then different attributes, like whether it's a hard cover available or an ebook. Um, so there's really a lot of data, data associated with the books. And uh, if you just create the content type for a book and you have the normal manage display setting, uh, each field is just displayed one after the other. But in actual fact, uh, the way that we want the book data to be displayed is a lot more sophisticated than that. So some of the fields, for example, further down the page are collapsed. Some of them um, have to be transformed into to links. Some of them have different formatting that has to be applied to them. And even just in this simple example from the top, there's a whole bunch of fields that have to be displayed in line, some of them bold, some of them in these pipes uh, between the, the fields. And so this would be impossible to do just with uh, simple configuration of fields through managed display. Like you have to take some other approach to get the fields to show up like this. So two approaches we can um, look at. So if you create a node template for the book, obviously you can create a template that would take those fields and make them inline and add the pipe. Um, there's quite a bit of code you'd actually have to include because uh, a lot of the fields for this book are optional, and so if there's a field missing, you'd have to make sure that it's still rendered correctly. Uh, on the configuration side, you could create a view that uses a contextual filter, and use that to place the fields for the current node on the page. So it might seem a little bit, again, a little bit overkill to create views to display the fields for the current node, but it does make it quite flexible because as you might know, um, with views, you can really override the HTML output of each field. So if you were creating this with a view, you would just be using the, the fields option in views to show, show fields instead of showing a, uh, a teaser, and then, or a teaser or a full note. And then for each field, you would have control over uh, changing the HTML, making the fields like inline, um, and using different formatters that are available for the fields in the first place. Also for, for uh, Drupal 8, if you're using views to output uh, these types of fields, you can use Twig. So Twig is the, the templating language for Drupal 8. You can use the Twig syntax right inside the views configuration. 
So you can actually build a template file within the configuration for this content. Uh, so that might beg the question, are you doing theming or are you doing configuration? You're kind of doing both at the same time but you're doing it within the Drupal admin UI, so it does make it more flexible, again, for someone else to come along and make those changes. So in this case, what approach would I take? Uh, I find this, this one particularly tricky because I think the no template approach would lead to a very complex template but the views approach would also lead to fairly complicated views. Um, and in the act our actual implementation for this, my, my colleague created a whole set of views for the book page, uh, and so all the blocks were placed on the page, and I had a bit of trouble figuring out what he had done. Um, so uh, it's, hard, it's hard to pick the best approach uh, in this case. I'd say in either case, the key would be documentation. So if you have a really complex content type and you're trying to display the fields in a very um, specific way, in either case, you would want to make sure that in your node template you have documentation and in your in views, you're also able to add documentation. So uh, in a view where you're combining a lot of fields together and you're manipulating the output, you can change the label of fields that you're, you're adding. Um, and that would allow you to actually build some documentation right into the configuration. So as anyone else who comes along to edit the view is going to see, oh yeah, there's a field here that's called uh, combined additions info. And that would at least give me some indication that this field is a field that takes all the additions info and puts it together in a, in a line. So, Taking that extra time to, to document your approach in this case, I think would be essential. Uh, the other thing to consider is whether any of this work that you're doing could be reused. So if you're doing a lot of work overriding the output of a content type, you want to make sure you know, like, is this the only content type that you're doing this for, or could this apply to multiple content types? So if you're doing a node template, uh, you'd want to consider that. Maybe consider uh, pointing two content types towards the same node template so you could reuse your work if needed. Um, and in the same way for the view, you'd want to make sure that you were, uh, you were making the views components reusable if there was, say, like an ebook content type as well as a, a hardcover or a physical book content type. Okay, another, another topic that I come across all the time and I've, I've often struggled with is the question of whether to use uh, view modes when you're displaying a list of content or whether you're using uh, fields. Yeah, and that's in your view. So who here is familiar with view modes? Anyone created view modes before, like custom view modes for their site? No? Okay, so whenever I talk about view modes, I think about like a media website. Like, uh, think of, I don't know, your favorite newspaper website. Uh, you go to the front page and they might have many, many lists of news. And a lot of times those news items are displayed in different ways to make the site more exciting. So you have maybe sometimes like a thumbnail of each one, or sometimes there's a bit of text in the author's name or the column name. Um, sometimes there's maybe a bigger image or a smaller image. Um, and so one way to implement this if you're using Drupal is to have different view modes for each of those types of displays. So every time you're displaying the, the content, you can say, oh, I want to show uh, not just a teaser, but like a mini teaser, or I want to show uh, a two-liner, or I want to show the uh, title and byline version. So you might have different names for these, and these would be the view modes you could use for your news. Um, the other way to print out a list of, of content in Drupal, like if you're using views, is to uh, use uh, fields. So you can just go ahead and create your view with news, 
And you can configure within that view that you want to display the title in the byline, or you want to display the title in an image. So it's basically the difference between using a teaser version of each node and using just whatever fields you feel like using. Uh, so the nice thing about using view modes is that if you create a view mode once, a view mode is, is something that you can reuse throughout your site. So if you have a list of news on the home page where you're using um, the thumbnail and a title, then you could go ahead and use that on other landing pages throughout the site, and you wouldn't have to reconfigure those fields. So it just makes it into a more reusable um, But typically you can achieve the same thing with fields, where you're just saying, I want to print the title, I want to print the, the, the summary text, and I want to print the image. Uh, this is another example of the same thing. This, this uses view mode. So these are uh, kind of like uh, events, upcoming events in a view. Um, and so there's a, there's a view mode that prints out the image and prints out these fields. Uh, and this can be also reused throughout the site. So both of these methods include configuration, but it's just a matter of which configuration approach you're taking. And uh, the configuration approach that uses view modes uh, does allow you to, uh, I don't think I wrote this slide correctly, but this does allow you to uh, um, combine using uh, like the view mode approach would allow you to have a template file for each of these that you can set up. But then the view mode itself, when you're using it, you would be configuring it. So uh, the nice thing about view modes is if you're planning to add additional views in the future, it would mean that you could just reuse those view modes. And then the person setting up the view wouldn't have to do any kind of theming to make the fields look the way they should because the view mode is already going to be taking care of that. So it would lead to more consistent display of content in the context of uh, adding views in the future. Uh, and the advantage of doing the fields approach is that it's just more flexible, easier to set up to begin with, and you don't have to worry about creating the the view modes. So one of them is easier kind of in the site build and one of them is going to be maybe easier to maintain. Uh, next, we can talk a little bit about images. So uh, often on your site, and we kind of already looked at some examples of banners, often on your site you'll have images that you want to manipulate. and. Uh, you can do this, obviously, with image styles. So everyone here probably know that you can change the size of an image before you display it by creating an image style. Um, but sometimes what you want to do to the image is to change uh, the actual, like, more like the, uh, not just the proportions, but the actual display. Like, if it's used for a background image, maybe you need to add an overlay on top. So this, this adding a green overlay, this is something that you could do with an image style. There's a module called uh, Image Style Effects that allows you to add things like this pretty easily. Um, but you can also do this with CFS. So the configuration approach would be to use the module to generate a new image style with a, with a green overlay. And the, uh, the uh, more theming approach would be to do it with CSS. And again, the, uh, the advantage of doing it with configuration is that you would then have an image style that you could reuse. So if you had um, maybe use for this green overlay uh, kind of styling for, for lots of different images on your site and you don't know yet where you want to use that, it's really easy with an image style just to reuse um, an effect or reuse the image style itself in multiple places. Whereas with the CSS approach, you'd have to create that overlay and then make sure that the overlay could be uh, added to the other images. So you'd actually have to work to do every time 
you add an image with the same styling um, to make sure that, that that works properly. So the image style effects easier to reapply, but a little bit um, more overhead because you have to have this extra module installed. Uh, block placement is a is another kind of category of uh, conundrum situations you might face. So this is something that um, you typically run into even just looking at the wireframes for a site, uh, often on landing pages or in the header of a footer of the site. You have to place blocks to get things showing up where you want, obviously. So one of the things we run into as humors is figuring out what, what you should uh, use regions for. Uh, so in this case, let's say we have uh, in this footer area, it's, it's possible that we would just have one region, right, for the whole footer. So we could, in our theme, just define the one footer region and then throw all the blocks into that region. But you notice that in the footer, there's the site map of the site, this menu here on the left, and then there's the contact information on the right. So it would be a little bit more flexible if we had three regions, or four regions even here, right? To have a region for the footer top, a region for footer left, footer right, and then footer bottom. So we'd end up actually creating four regions for these four different blocks. Because even though they all have this background, flat background, they're all at the bottom of the page, they're placed in a bit of a different way. So that's the question. Do you make one big region and then just float this block left, float this block right, or do you take the time to set up the four regions? Um, and this might happen in other places on your site. You might have blocks that need to be placed into a grid, and you wonder, like, should I create six different regions for this, or do I just create one region, and then the blocks in that region just get floated? Or I use flex blocks in my CSS to put them into this, into this grid. So the configuration approach, well, uh, it, it allows for more configuration, I guess. It also involves theming, but it, it means that you can create a region for, for every part of the layout, and then you just place the block in the right region, and it shows up in the right place. This approach does mean that you might have a bunch of regions on your site that only ever have one block in them. So it might seem a little bit, um, like those regions are maybe a little bit useless. Um, the, the more, um, theme heavy approach, I guess, is that you just configure the blocks and give a region to behave in a certain way. So you could say, uh, create a certain template file specifically for the blocks in a region, or you could just use CSS to do that floating. Um, and in that case, you would just have to have good documentation to tell the site builder that when you put the blocks in this region, they're going to behave like this. They're going to go into a grid. Uh, in the case of the footer example, you would actually have to use specific block, uh, a block class or a block ID to say that this uh, block needs to be pulled left and that one needs to be pulled right. So it might, uh, it might be a little bit more brittle because then when someone comes along, maybe they'll add a block between these two items and then your styling is going to get a bit messed up. So it's maybe a less uh, robust approach to, to do it that way. Um, tabs within your content. So this maybe goes even beyond theming. So you might have content on your site where you want to be putting, creating, breaking up the content into multiple pages. So in this case, there's uh, these school board pieces of content are quite complex. There's actually a separate page for each one, a separate tab. Uh, and so there's different approaches. You could use a module to accomplish this, something like Quick Tabs. Uh, there's other, other modules that use JavaScript to, to accomplish something like this. Or you could actually create separate pages programmatically. And this would mean that you could place the blocks on each page just with configuration. Um, so the second approach is 
uh, doesn't involve adding ex any extra modules, so it's a bit more lightweight. Um, but it does mean that if you ever wanted to add a new tab, you'd have to go back to your code and, and update that. So again, pros and cons. Um, probably more stable approach would be to do it programmatically, but it wouldn't allow for flexibility in the future. I'm doing for time. Okay. Another example so, menu icons. So, you might have a menu or even a view on your site where you're printing out icons. Um, and you see this often with like more fancy menus, like mega menus, or with, uh, with views that are trying to be a bit more visual. Um, and in this case, there's an icon associated with each one. So when you're building this out, you probably be asking, like, are these icons uh, a fixed, is there like a fixed set of icons? Are the icons always going to be the same? Are there going to be more items added? Like, do I need to add any ones in the future? Uh, so you're trying to figure out how flexible does this need to be. And I'm always really hesitant about adding icons to a theme because inevitably someone wants to change them or someone wants to add a new one and then you have to go back and figure out like how do I actually create these icon images? How do I make sure they're consistent? Someone actually has to design a new one uh, so it tends to be a little more brittle. So um, if possible I tend to try and use some kind of existing icon set or something like Font Awesome which allows you to just use an existing um, font set to create the icon, so it's super flexible. Um, so for the configuration approach, you, if these were menu items, you could set up um, a module that would allow you to configure a class for each item that would include the icon. Um, or if you wanted to do a more theming approach, you could create a template file for each one. But as soon as you create a template file for a menu item, like you're kind of setting yourself up for a disaster because menu items are actually content in Drupal and that means that there might be a new one added tomorrow. Um, so I would, I would highly advise against any, pro any approach actually in theming that involves creating a template for uh, a piece of content. So that means like if you ever create a template file and it has a node ID in it or a taxonomy term ID or a menu item ID, like think twice, like stop what you're doing and reassess if, it, if it's the only way to do it. Uh, last thing I want to talk about is web form styling. So how many of you have used web forms for Drupal 8? Yeah, so web, web forms is a great module. Web forms for Drupal 8 is like a, a, new, a new thing, like there's a lot of new stuff in there that's really awesome, like I think you'll be really excited to try it out. Um, and one of the things about web forms, if you haven't used them before, web forms is just a way of generating forms as content on your site. So each form is, is sort of like, sort of like a, a piece of, of content because it's something you can easily create and manage. Um, but it also obviously is like configuration because you're configuring fields. And in Drupal 8, web forms are more like configuration than ever before. So um, it's a bit of a tricky thing to, to figure out whether to treat them as content or treat them as configuration. And one issue I've run into with web forms is that often in the design of a form, you want to treat certain elements specifically. Like in this case, you're picking the, the subject of the form, um, or sorry, this is French, so you're, you're saying like, who, who are you? Are you just a general person? Are you a participant or are you a researcher? So it's treating that field differently. It's putting it into a, you know, an inline, an inline layout. So the three radio buttons. And so the question is, how you, how do you set this up? Because if you just hard code that in your CSS, it's going to work great today. But then, what if someone comes along to the web form and adds another option, and then there's no room for it there? Or what if someone replaces this field with something else? and they want it to behave the same way. They want it to be in the, in the, all in a row, these three items. So it brings into question, like, should you be putting this 
CSS for this form into your theme, or should you be trying to fit it into the configuration of the web form? Because the web form itself has this configuration, and the design is sort of linked with the configuration itself. Uh, so if someone's going to come along and change this tomorrow, they should be able to change the design as well. So the web form configuration for Drupal 8 actually allows you to add a lot of styling. Um, and so it would be possible to do it there. And for me as a themer, like adding styling in configuration always feels wrong. Um, but if you're treating your web form more as content, more than something that might evolve and change, that it might be a more flexible approach. And then the theming approach would be more to put the CSS uh, into, into the theme itself. And that would just mean you'd have to make sure that that gets updated through adding new forms or changing the, the fields. Uh, okay, I lied. There's one last thing, uh, JavaScript. So there's lots of modules for Drupal that add JavaScript libraries. So this example here is like an FAQ page, and it uses Vue's accordion to display the FAQ items. So you can open and close each one. Um, an alternative would be to actually add a JavaScript library or some custom JavaScript yourself and to do that in your theme. So configuration approach is to add a module, the theming approach is to add the JavaScript yourself. And either way is perfectly you know, acceptable in Drupal, um, but the first approach might mean that you end up with uh, a lot of modules on your site. Um, and you might be able to do something a bit cleaner if you add the JavaScript yourself. Uh, one thing I just want to point out is that for Drupal 8, it's really easy to manage libraries in your theme. So you can set up a library for uh, accordion JavaScript, and you could say that that is only going to load on this set of pages. So you have a, a lot of control over how that JavaScript gets used. So you don't have to worry about it kind of bloating your site like you might have worried about uh, uh, previously. In Drupal 7, you could do kind of the same thing with, um, with uh, Drupal Add JS. Um, but in Drupal 8, it's just uh, much more integrated with the whole theme system. So I find it's a bit easier to do. Uh, so one last note before I close. Um, in Drupal 8, when you create configuration, you are managing it as code. So typically, if you're setting up a configuration workflow, like I mentioned at the beginning, like every time that you edit a view or every time that you edit a node, or not, not a node, a content type, the ideal workflow is for you to take that and export it and put it into your, your version control. So this distinction that I'm making between theming and configuration, it's important because there's definitely different sets of people who are comfortable with theming and configuration. And configuration is a more, um, you know, it's a more accessible thing for a lot of people. But at the same time, in an ideal world, you would actually be taking that configuration, exporting it to these YAML files and committing it, which, you know, it sounds a lot to me like a developer task. So it's not necessarily like putting something into configuration just means that anyone can do it and it's, it's easy to do. Um, in Drupal 8, typically anything that's configuration is part of this configuration management workflow. And so it's something that um, is managed more like code. So I just want to point that out because it's, uh, it's kind of a new thing for Drupal 8 and it's, uh, it's going to change how you work how you do uh, these types of changes after your site is launched. Uh, so I, uh, I covered a few examples today. There are lots of other things like this. But um, what I hope that you'll take away from this is just um, this sense of like making a decision. So when you're implementing the front end of your site, when you're deciding whether you're going to do something with theming, you're going to do something with configuration, um, that you ask yourself these these questions, like what you expect on the site, do you expect something to be repeated, do you expect it to change, who's going to maintain it, like thinking through these things when you start to build is going to help you build something that's more maintainable in the long run. And even if you make all the same decisions, I think you'll, you'll maybe have a, a better um, 
sort of just mindset of like looking at the theme and knowing what's what's in there, tracking what you're doing, um, and making sense of of the decisions that you're making. Might make might make the decisions more confident, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So thanks so much for attending. Uh, if you uh, are interested, I'll just put these dates back up on the board. And um, I don't know how much time I have left, but if you have any questions I'd love to, or ideas, I'd love to hear them. I have five minutes, so apparently. Three. Three minutes. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. So I guess a, a lot of the decisions come down to sometimes preference. Um, one thing I like to do is related things together um, in web forms. You talked about as a CSS theme or the CSS sample um, is big. I guess I'm leaning towards having CSS big as a web form because it's together when it's a CSS theme. If somebody else were to go and modify the web form after I had built it, they have to know where to find it in the CSS file. The exactly, yeah. And that's um, a similar workflow with the, the content types. Like if you're adding a field to a content type, ideally that field would go somewhere logical. And if you have the, the layout right there in the content type config, then someone can see, oh, I added this field and it was placed here. That's why it's showing here. So it kind of puts things more together. So yeah, it's a great point. Any other thoughts? If you have any uh, any questions or any feedback about the talk, please come find me afterwards. I'll be wandering around. Um, and thank you so much for your time.